Two Geeks, Two Beers. Episode 64, Red Dwarf Interview Special with Doug Naylor and Richard Naylor. Well, no one's got any disease, man. We're clean. You have to re-screen us, sir, as per Directive 699. No one's got any virus and no one's smegging nuts. Well, that's good. <laughs> Is something amiss? Amiss? God, no. What could possibly be amiss? You don't think there's anything amiss? I'm sitting here wearing a red and white checked gingham dress <laughs> and army boots. <laughs> you think that's unamiss? Well, we've passed the test, Rima. You can let us out. I can't let you out. Why not? Because the king of the potato people won't let me. <laughs> Hello, and welcome to Two Geeks, Two Beers, with me, Tom, and my fellow geek in isolation, Morgan Jeffrey. Isolation. Hello. <laughs> um, so, in case you haven't uh, listened to our Patreon special, which, let's face it, you haven't. Um, <laughs> You might notice that the quality, the audio quality of this is slightly different than usual. That's because, obviously, like you, we are in our self-isolation. Yeah. Well, well we're, we're, in, we're in lockdown. We're not in self-isolation. Yeah. No. Um, we don't live together slightly... in case, you, in case you, you thought we were like Bert and Ernie or something like that. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, and, and knock on wood, we're, 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 we're well. Um, yeah. But yeah, you may have noticed that the audio quality is even worse than usual. Um, <laughs> but yeah. the banter will continue to be top-notch. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Is there any point us going through beers? Probably not. No, well, uh, yeah, trying to uh, find a beer that fits the theme yeah. is harder than usual because we can't leave the house. Um, yeah. And basically all delivery services have shut down as well. Yeah. So I'm uh, <laughs> going to pause the, uh, the themed beer gimmick uh, <laughs> for, the, for the foreseeable, yeah. which... You know, which is not the biggest... We've got back to our roots, really, aren't we? That's what we used to do. (laughs) There are more important things to worry about at a time like this. Yeah, although I am drinking a Corona, so, you know... (laughs) You're you're on brand, at least. Yeah. Um, Anyway, we're rambling. So for this very special episode, uh, Mm. episode 64, Mm. we're very excited, because for episode 44, we sat down with uh, Jamie Anderson, son of Jerry Anderson, to talk all things uh, Thunderbirds, Terrorhawks and beyond. Episode 54, we sat down with big Finnish Supremo and Voice of the Daleks himself, Nicholas Briggs, and for episode 64, well, we didn't sit down with, but we chatted via Zoom with geek hero Doug Naylor, the co-creator and chief writer-director of Red Dwarf, and his son, the show's producer, Richard Naylor. Um, wow. And we've, we've kind of had this for the pipe, in the pipeline for a while. Um, and even when this whole coronavirus thing started, we, we didn't want it to get in the way. But we, so we found a way. Life sometimes finds a way. And uh, <laughs> uh, we amazingly got to chat with them both for about 45 minutes about all things Dwarf and their geek heroes and all that kind of thing. Um, yeah. Doug and Rich uh, spoke with us to promote Red Dwarf, The Promised Land, which is the new feature-length special, which uh, aired on Dave and is available uh, on UK TV Play, the catch-up service. I believe it's also available uh, on Blu-ray via Amazon. Uh, but we also uh, reflected on uh, the series history, uh, as you said, their, their, their own inspirations, and also got them to uh, sort of answer uh, some long unanswered Red Dwarf questions so it was a lot of fun yeah so enjoy and we'll be back at the end of the episode you don't need me I'm not sure you ever did guys if we're going to get through this we need to stick together we have to find a new ship we're not surrendering brace for impact coming for hello and welcome to Two Geeks Two Beers podcast Doug Naylor and Richard Naylor great to be here thank hi, you hi guys so at the moment, it must feel like you're also in some kind of suspended like animation, like Lister. Yeah, a lot of people are making that comparison, aren't they? Uh, <laughs> we, we thought we were being original, but... <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it's just weird because as a, as a writer, I mean, staying in a lot is part of the job. So it's not quite maybe as strange. Well, if, if you were to maybe introduce yourselves so that Lister would understand it, perhaps, um, that would be, that'd be brilliant. Okay, I'm Doug Nella, I'm the writer director uh, of Red Dwarf Promised Land and uh, co-created uh, Red Dwarf with Rob Brown. And I'm uh, Richard Naylor. I merely produced The Promised Land. Well, um, we should probably introduce ourselves too, I suppose, and what Red Dwarf means to us. Um, I know Morgan is a, is a big fan. 
Yeah, I, um, I, I've been a big fan, you know, going all the way back to uh, the BBC era. Um, I remember watching it, you know, when I was younger and I just immediately fell in love with the, the, the characters, the concept. Um, I, I love that it was obviously very funny, but the, the, the science fiction concepts um, always held water. That was a big part of the appeal for me. Um, uh, so yeah, I was, it was a huge, huge fan. I had smeg ups on VHS, the whole package. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, and for me, I think I would have been about seven, um, it was about 93 or something like that. And my dad had a VHS of series one. We had the rest of the show at that point recorded. And even though I was probably far too young to understand most of the jokes, I just loved the characters and I wore out those tapes. And, um, so yes, yeah, so just thanks for creating something, working on, the, on something that's so important for so many people. Oh, thank you, thank you. Let's not start right at the beginning, I guess, but the present day, um, oh, Promised well, Land. Um, yeah. It's what Red Dwarf fans have been excited about for decades, a kind of Red Dwarf feature-length movie special. Um, so I know that years and years ago, there was a Red Dwarf movie as an idea had been rumoured, um, but for whatever reason, didn't quite materialise. So tell us a little bit about the backstory behind the Red Dwarf movie of old and how it morphed into what became The Promised Land. Well, it hasn't really morphed at all. There were two quite separate projects. Uh, Red Dwarf movie originally was going to have a, a budget of 20 million. Uh, and that was um, what was kind of promised. And I was dispatched to Australia to, um, to go through all the studios, choose the studio, choose a crew, blah, blah, blah. And the money would come in at any time. <clears throat> um, and then it fell away. Um, so... Uh, we're in fact, we actually ha were down to have the same cameras as George Lucas had shot on Phantom Menace. Wow. It, wow. it lived to us before the days uh, were of, of digital, because he was kind of like the first digital movie, uh, George Lucas. And it was just because he'd shot some, must have shot some stuff in Australia. Um, they were there and we were, we bagsied them after, after George. So it's like, oh my God, I don't believe this world I'm in at the moment. Um, however, the money fell away. Um, and then it was just stay put, uh, rewrite the script. Instead of 20 million, we think we can get you 15 million, do a 15 million pound version of, of, of the script. <laughs> so uh, this kind of went on. And then a guy called, I was uh, living in Queensland, a guy called the office, Grand Naylor office to say that um, he had just pulled out of a Will Smith movie uh, <laughs> and we had 16 million pounds um, that he was looking to invest in something. Um, and, and would this be, no, actually, sorry, I tell I had 60 million. That's right. I had 60 million. Uh, he was looking to invest in something and, um, big Red Wolf fan, could he put it in the movie? And I went, yeah, absolutely. You bet. How much do you need? Probably only 20. He went fantastic. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'm, I'm in uh, Melbourne. I'll fly over. And I went, great. And he said, where are you? <laughs> oh, great. Um, and then, uh, he said, so who's paying for, for my, my, um, my air fire. <laughs> uh, well, I thought the other guy was 60 million. Well, <laughs> anyway, yeah, okay, that's fine. I'll pay for it, no problem. And he said, and, and can I stay with you in your apartment? Uh, and I, went, I think you're probably better off in a hotel. I'll tell you what, I'll, I'll get you in touch with the producer. He could talk about all, you know, all the, the logistics of your visit. So I found the producer said, I think this guy's probably a nuts. Uh, <laughs> but talk to him and see where you get. So he spoke to him, called me back and said he claims to be the Duke of Manchester uh, and he's got all his money from nobility. Um, and I went, stop there, I'm from Manchester. <laughs> there is no such thing as the Duke of Manchester. That's just a <laughs> such a lame lie. Uh, so anyway, we didn't think any more about it. We went out for dinner that night and making loads of jokes of, you know, a limo arrived outside the door and we were going, oh my God, it's the Duke of Manchester. And then I thought, I'm just going to get the office to check. It's crazy. Uh, and so I phoned the office in England and said, look, I know this is mad, but just check. There's no such thing as the chicken Manchester. Is there? <laughs> and so they phoned me back almost immediately and said, actually, Doug, there is. Uh, but he moved to Melbourne. Uh, his, his family moved to Melbourne and, uh, about 30 years ago. And then suddenly it was that zoom in, pull out moment in Jaws. Where it's like, <laughs> oh, my God, was I rude to him? What did I say? He's probably just slightly eccentric. And no, I wasn't rude. It's fine. Okay. So I found the producer, get on the on the on the phone to the to the Duke of Manchester, call his lordship, 
and say, absolutely, let's let's meet. Um, and the producer went, yeah, but we just need some proof that he is actually, you know, kosher. So um, he phoned him and the Duke of Manchester said he was a, a great friend of Kate Blanchett uh, and she would vouch for him. So I went, brilliant. And so he gave the, uh, the uh, phone number to the producer, Kate Blanchett's number. He phoned the number, it was all immediately and it was engaged. Um, and then uh, he finally got through five minutes later and then a woman answered the phone, clearly holding her nose, claiming <laughs> to be Kate Blanchett with a terrible stinking ah, cold to the extent yeah. she didn't really sound like herself with this cold. So, puts the phone down, it's the end of this, boom. Duke of Manchester calls up a week later and says, how did you get on with Kate? And there's like <laughs> F-bombs F, F and God knows what from the producer. And he went, what are you talking about? That was Kate Blanchett. He said, look, what do I have to do? I want to give you all this money. I want to come on board. Um, uh, I'll tell you what I'll do. I will um, fax you, and this was the day of faxes, I will fax you my bank account and you will see I've got a ton of money in there. And he Sure enough, the facts came through and it had actually had a hundred million. I think it was a hundred million uh, in, in his account. But what, all he'd done is he'd tip X'd off, you know, what was really in his account and just clearly <laughs> typed in. <laughs> and then this guy turned out to do this quite a lot to people in terms of um, just getting them excited. He used to do it to rock band and you're the greatest, going to be the greatest rock band in the world. You're going to be bigger than the Beatles. You're going to be this, you're going to be that. And, and he got kind of a thrill from this. So then um, the money kind of disappeared. And then another guy came on board and he said, uh, hey, you've been really, really screwed around by all sorts of people. And um, I'm, I'm absolutely not going to do that to you. I'm going to be absolutely straight. And what we've got to do is we've got to pretend we've got the money for the movie before we've got the money for the movie. And then that will attract the money for the movie. So it's like, Okay, so he went to a meeting and we had this really strange meeting where he was there and this other guy came in who was also part of a bank, I think it was, and they both pointed at one another and went, if he's attending this meeting, I'm not. And it was like this, and they were both saying the same things. This guy's a con man. No, this guy's a con man. Right, well, that. So it's just a huge, anyway. So we didn't know who to believe. And anyway, long story short, he called me a few weeks later and said, look, I'm, Sadly, I'm going to have to withdraw from the project uh, because of shed scheduling issues, uh, which you'll probably find out sooner or later. And it turned out he was being sent to prison. Oh, those, my God. That's quite a scheduling issue. issue. Yeah. yeah, that's quite a big scheduling <laughs> issue. Um, so then it was like, okay, I've done, I think it was 35 drafts of, 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 this, of the screenplay. Um, visited all these studios, uh, visited Berlin, Luxembourg, uh, Austria, Australia, all these places on this wild goose chase. And I thought, now, now's time to just draw a line into this. And then just towards the end, the money came in. Uh, and that was when it looked like, oh, it could happen. Um, but it was, it was down to the BBC uh, putting in the million pounds for the TV rights. And then by then their policy had changed, um, which was um, they didn't buy individual films. They bought packages off movies. Okay, well, that's, that's the end of that then. Um, meantime, there were repeats on Dave, um, which were getting fantastic figures, bigger than anything, bigger than Fools and Horses, bigger than anything. And then they came along and said, um, will you do a sort of clip show with the guys in their costumes introducing some of the, you know, the best sketches or scenes from, from the series. Mm. And I said, well, if we're going to do that, we'll be better off um, doing a whole show. Essentially, the movie was, was its own thing when that yeah. happened. Certain yeah. elements of the recycle, but this was a pro very much. It was always going to be a 90-minute a television special, no, yeah. not linked to the movie, not, no elements were recycled. I don't think there's a single... There's perhaps one moment or, or, or one joke yeah, that was it's all new, completely it's all all brand completely. new. I mean, I mean, it came from UK TV wondering whether we could do anything different. Um, we'd just done uh, 12 shows back to back, which were Red Dwarf 11 and 12, but mm. they kept 
uh, 12 on the shelf for a year so they could have two series going. And then they come up with the idea of, hey, why don't we do a special? Why don't you do a special? And um, Richard very, you know, smartly pointed out, why will it be special if we just have the same budget? <laughs> um, uh, what will be special about that? And when they went, well, it'll be instead of three thirties, I mean, instead of, you know, it will be 90 minutes all, all, you know, like a film. I think, I think even the landscape, the, the landscape between 2017 when series 12 went out, has it, changed so dram- uh, dramatically in the last mm. three years and trying channels like Dave that are kind of a little bit harder to find than terrestrial or, or the video on demand services they feel like maybe their money, I think now is better spent on these event nights, you know, mm-hmm. special, you're not asking an audience to be, you know, consistent for six weeks in a row, tune in, go to, whereas this, this, they wanted something they could go, Hey, look, everyone stick around, watch the whole thing. And, um, like most series, you know, if there's a little bit of a tail off, it's, it's, it's kind of normal, but it's not great for the, for the network. So they, yeah, said, why don't we do a special? And it took a bit of convincing. No one thought it was necessarily the right thing to do. Mm. Um, but Especially. by the end, everyone's very happy and, and yeah. kind of glad we did it. So it was a yeah, very really smart happy. Yeah. move. So did you have to kind of come at it from a completely different angle than you would for a series? It, have you found in the past that 30 minutes is a little bit of a restriction, so it gave you more chance to put more in? Or? Yeah, absolutely. It's always like, yeah, 30 minutes seems so short. And that's what was the difficulty when we did Back to Earth. Back to Earth was 23 minutes. Mm. And, um, and, and also with a minute budget. And also, because you want to do stuff you haven't done before, um, and be able to investigate ideas that there, there just isn't time or that much time to do in, in 30 minutes. When we started to kind of uh, talk about it, we thought, oh, actually, you know, there, there, it, we could get something quite interesting here from this. And also there is a, a degree of, you know, our guest set can be a really, you know, big deal. And this guest set, as it were, um, on the Iron Star, filled up an entire studio. There was sort of two two elements. There was a sort of creative approach for Doug co- coming at structuring it and kind of hooking people in, what kind of story, get an exposition, not making it kind of not totally isolating casual viewers. And then there was also a sort of production um, complications, sort of the production side, how to get a 90-minute show in front of the audience how much of that is going to be shown in front of the audience what's audience laughter like for 90 minutes is that you know is it going to annoy people is it so there were there were a lot of things to work out um but you just start with the script really and and that's what doug did and then took it from there and i think it's worked well excellent quick thinking listy just one question how are you proposing to fly what remains of the ship when all the engines are in the bit you've just ejected (laughs) I'm probably worrying needlessly, I know. <laughs> to be honest, I didn't have an amazing amount of time to go through every option. You mean, like, use a fire extinguisher? Use a fire extinguisher, that could have worked too. <laughs> I just thought, at the time, ship's on fire, get rid of the fiery bit. Get rid of the fiery bit, worry about the fly bit later. <laughs> Tomorrow's another day. Unfortunately, we need to get past today to get to tomorrow, and it's the today part of your Wizzo escape plan that concerns me. <laughs> Crichton, what's our present flight path? It's down, sir. <laughs> Could you possibly be a bit more specific? Well, it's straight down, sir. <laughs> and sort of going back to what I was saying at the beginning, um, uh, I think, you know, go right back from the beginning of the show and then, you know, looking at classic episodes like Back to Reality, Gunman of the Apocalypse, um, Part of what's great about it is that it's not only very funny, but the the sci-fi concepts they do hold water. And if you almost if you took the jokes out, it would still work as a brilliant bit of science fiction. Um, is that something that's important to you both? You know, when you're coming up with a new story for Red Dwarf, that the, as I say, the sci-fi itself uh, holds water. Yeah, I mean, I think also in some of the later series, um, yeah, M4, for example, you know, we were able to satirize things that maybe the earlier shows didn't still great science fiction ideas um and i don't know why that is particularly but yeah you want to have that cool heart uh, uh it, um, so it's about something you know whether it's a scientific idea like science being banned in twenica uh or um virtual reality in in, in back to uh, reality 
or, or some, you know, some of the stuff on multinationals or indeed religion. Um, yeah, we want it to be have a have have a meaning in the in, in in the heart of it. And whenever you do reunite with the cast, how long does it normally take for you to kind of get back into the swing of it all? Have have they changed? How much have they changed? Although it's strange because we we did a, a talk a chat through of uh, quarantine last night. Um, and it was really interesting listening to Craig's accent, which is completely different uh, back in 1992 to his accent today. And so, and he was pointing out he hadn't lived in Liverpool for 35 years. To answer the question, we immediately, you know, it's like just putting on a comfy pair of slippers. Uh, we're immediately just back in the swing of things uh, as soon as we hook up, really. It's a hard show to make. Um, mm. Just coming at it, obviously, only being involved sort of later. As the guys have got, you know, a little bit older, I, it's a hard, I think, imagine it was a hard enough show to make when they were in their 20s and 30s. Um, it, it's, it's very demanding, and it would be of any actor, but um, they've managed to just still maintain a kind of real enthusiasm, and, you know, they're putting on helmets filled with, you know, in corridors filled with haze and smoke and running and debris falling down on them and... They still do it, you know, and, and it's, it's, they're sort of just straight in, aren't they? Like sort of yeah. ducks to water and, and yeah. get up. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, there's a good, there's a good, really good chemistry there, sort of on camera and off camera. Yeah. They do, they do actually genuinely love making them. That's the thing. And being together. Maybe more being together than making them. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, well, uh, Rich, um, I think you did you say you've been working on it since is it back to earth you you started working no, on? no i started i i came on as a, a, a i i think i helped out on back to earth i think hmm. there was no budget so i think i came on as a runner i was just sort of trying to help out offer a pair of hands i think i roped in a couple of friends as well because it's just <laughs> um yeah there's just there's nothing there but then um i went away i, I was at went to film school and then i came back as uh, co-producer or associate producer on, on 10. So 10 was the first sort of official uh, proper role I had on, on, um, on the series, uh, which was good because I was able to sort of, it was more, you know, what I always wanted the show to go back to, you know, get the studio audience back. And that was, you know, a lot of it was just about budget and UK TV's commitment and, and all of that. But everyone wanted that, but it was just, um, it was, a, it was a good one to sort of start on. What was it like kind of growing up in the world of, of Dwarf? Because uh, I think you went well, I, to the kid once in one episode. As yeah, well. I mean, I, when I was young, I, mean, I think series seven, series eight, I was maybe about nine or ten. I kind of avoided it when I was young <laughs> because I had a lot of kids going, Naylor, oh, go get us Craig Charles' autograph, go do this. <laughs> and I, I was sort of aware of it, but there was one point, you know, with, with a lot of young boys, it was just massive and people, you know, such strange memories I have of people going, I've heard the rudest word in, in the world is smeg and you know, your dad's a bastard for creating that. My mum said, you know, so I was just like, oh, okay, I'll stay clear. And I remember walking around the sets on series eight and it was all, it was all a bit of a blur. So I must've been fairly young then. I remember going on set for Gunman of the Apocalypse and so I've got little flashing memories, but I, I generally avoided it. And then I think when I was about, 15 or 16, I remember we had all the VHS tapes. I remember I was about 14, actually. And I thought I should probably watch these. So I watched them and, and, and you know, liked them. And then when, um, when I got a bit older, I thought, no, I should probably watch these properly. <laughs> and, and, yeah, and, you know, I became a fan. It's, it's strange to say, but, yeah, I, I, you know, loved the shows. But then going into it, um, when I kind of got a bit of confidence and, and then sort of started working on it, I thought, oh, okay, there are things I'd like to see in the show as... As a, as a fan I was able to sort of step back and and now as a sort of producer of it you know I've you know I strive you know I, I brought the more I was one of the big factors of bringing the models back for series 10 with Doug I wanted those back in and then this series I wanted them out because I just didn't think they really held up so people <laughs> might hate me for that but um yeah I've I've I'm a big fan of the show and you know I love working on it it's such a brilliant show to work on regardless of the sort of family connection it's not many shows you get you know CGI there's effect shots you know action props sci-fi sets comedy studio audience so it's um really fun to work on so I'm very lucky now this is a little unconventional I grant you 
But with the Meditech we salvaged from the Delta 7, what I'm about to suggest is quite possible. So I implore you both to give it your full and proper consideration. Both? What's this got to do with me? Well, sir, what if you had a sex change operation? Let me finish. <laughs> and became a woman. Let me finish. <laughs> Mr. Lister and yourself could then do the necessary, <laughs> let me finish, and produce a child together. <laughs> Have you been drying your head in the tumble dryer again? And it's quite remarkable too, you know, how the, the lifespan that the show has had, the success it's had, um, Promised Land, you know, uh, references back and harks back to things from the earliest series as well as the later series. Um, the show is very much this kind of living, breathing entity at this point. When, when you're kind of looking to the, to the future of Red Dwarf, do you, do you ever envisage an end point? Or if it were to ever end, do you have a, a final story in mind? Or do you not even think about that? No, we've always said that we don't want to do the final show. You know, where here we are, Lister's back on Fuchel, mm. he's got his white horses <laughs> and somehow he's got Kachansky and they ride off into the distance and everyone sobs and goes, what a lame <laughs> shit show that was. <laughs> Why did you have Starbuck as well? Like she is. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah Starbuck parked there on the beach, yeah. <laughs> just terrific. Um, if, you, if you were going to end it, I, I, I mean, I, there'd possibly be a chance in, in a novel or something. I think I, you've, you've got some ideas that you've told me that yeah. I genuinely yes. think would be great endings. Yeah. But so, all those so. big moments, sometimes when you try and do them in a, in a sitcom budget, even if it's a healthy budget, just doesn't quite have the impact uh, as proven kind of over some, some moments in the previous years. So maybe a novel would be the best way to end it and, and you could, you could do, do more with... Also, I don't kind of want it to end, you know. No, you're not, nor, nor do I. <laughs> nor do we no, I don't want it to end. Just in that terms of because there will be, you know, another generation or whatever, whatever, you know. And so going, that's the end, you know. Um, I think would be it would be horrible. <laughs> uh, I'm tearing up just thinking about it. So, um, so no is the answer to the question. <laughs> Um, well, this is where we'll probably um, annoy you. We did, we've already put together like a list of um, Red Dwarf's unanswered questions. And so we thought, what better time to try and get some sort of answers? Oh, to the making of the show. <laughs> now, you don't actually have to answer these if you don't want to. You can refuse. Yeah. <laughs> Say no. But um, we Let's thought, go. why not? We'll give it a go. We'll give it a go. Okay. Um, so, number one, which yeah. Rimmer is currently in the show? Um, so I'll explain a backstory for the nerds, people that aren't as nerdy as we are, essentially. The original um, Rimmer. It is the original Rimmer. Cause, yes. Uh, so the original Rimmer left in Series 7, Tom yeah. Rimmer, and then yeah. um, a new one was created in Series 8 by Crichton's Nanobots. Yeah. But in yeah. the day there, it's clearly the original one. So It's the original Rimmer, yeah. Uh, will one we day, Doug's ever be explained in any way? Or? Yeah, Doug's going to do an encore where he explains all the loopholes. And, and, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. No, the, it was the original Rimmer. It was done, it came in uh, and we thought it was a good story. Um, but, Obviously, we want the original Rimmer back because it's the original Rimmer. And so that's what happened when we, we rebooted. Okay. So we, we probably won't get a, an official explanation. But um... The thing is, it's really difficult. It's if you spend all your time explaining <laughs> things that most people aren't interested in, <laughs> you're really going to be in trouble and you won't yeah. be allowed to do any more. No. And uh, in fact, someone did point out about the cat story and, and they did say, I think it was Andrew actually, said this is the great story that no one wanted to, to, to find out about. When, when, when he was just pitched the idea, he said, we don't care about the cats. And I went, well, I, yeah. the thing is you are limited in terms of, I'm gone off at a tangent here, forgive me, but you're limited in terms of, okay, what, you want an antagonist, who can the antagonist be? You know, it can't be aliens, it can't be, you know, blah, blah, blah. It can be a robot, it can be a this, it can be a that. And of course, it could be the cats who we know exist and are a part of Red Dwarf law. And so you get an idea like that and go, okay, so, okay, say, say the bad guys are the cats, why would be the bad guys? And then you start to fashion the story. Mm -hmm. Now that's coming out of 
let's try and create a great story with an antagonist, as opposed to what on earth happened to those cat people uh, with the cardboard hats and the whatever, whatever. Interject as well, Doug. There's, there's a side of, of sort of television making that a lot of fans don't see, which is you have to justify shows to, to get them away. And, you know, you are being asked, we've got, we're so lucky to be working with UK TV, but, you know, they'll come to us and say, or come to Doug and say, what's the idea? You know, and you go, oh, well, we, th- you know, we we'll want to do more iconic Red Bull stories, 30 minutes, you know, shows like Marooned, there's a really good chance to do Marooned. And it's, that's not exciting for, you know, they've done 12 shows of that. In fact, they've done, you know, 10, 11 and 12. So it's, it's not just, we'd like to go do a core Red Dwarf sci-fi, simple story, take that premise, roll with it, explore all the character comedy, the end. It's, well, no, because if it's more of the same, then that we're not going to be able to, how do we market it differently? How do we? So there is an element of storytelling which has to come from how are we going to, you know, the network want it, but they also want to be able to pitch it to their grown-ups, the board, mm-hmm. and, and so on and so forth. So there's always an element of that, unfortunately, which is it's got to be big. There's got to be antagonists. It's got to be adventure. It can't be, you know, the four of them in space, you know, come across an object and we explore how it affects them all because, you know, the network won't commission it basically. Yeah. They, want, they want certain aspects and you have to compromise. And um, so, so there is an element of that, which is, which is why certain stories are chosen. However, if you can sort of explain something along the way, in a, in a bigger story, um, you wouldn't be able to pitch. Um, quite a few fans are worrying about which rumour this is, and uh, we really want to just do a whole film to sort that out. Um, then we just go, see that door, close it down. Uh, <laughs> I guess, I guess yeah. this is the problem with sci-fi stuff in general, is it the, the kind of fans like us who watch these things, we, mm. we attach ourselves to very thing, things that the creators and the writers probably yeah, the law, not as important. The law is really important. And, and I think there is a really cool, exciting story to be told there, explaining a lot of the, um, the things by, by Doug, but it's finally the right moment for it. Yeah. And, and something like this is, and then also, you know, you know, it wasn't right to do intent necessarily. You want to hit the ground running sometimes with those series, but mm. There is, a, there is a time and there's, there's a good story there, I think. It's an exciting story. I mean, Red Wolf is guilty sometimes of, of um, not caring about backstory. And, um, and if we can do another new good show, we will ignore it a little bit. Um, <laughs> and it's always been a bit guilty of that. Um, but then most science fiction shows are like that. Doctor Who, you know, mm. ignores... Um, some backstory too. When Rimmer originally died aboard Red Dwarf, Holly brought him back as a hologram to keep me sane. Never an easy task. He succeeded spectacularly. And for this accomplishment, we award him this. Crichton, place First Officer Rimmer's decoration into the coffin. Right away, sir. Gentlemen, First Officer Rimmer. Well, you're going to love this next one. Um, this is this essentially um, we want to just we wanted to know: Are the resurrected Red Dwarf crew still technically out there? Like Captain Hollister when they escaped the, uh, the Red Dwarf. I, I couldn't possibly answer that question. I, I like to think <laughs> that all, I like to think they've all died. Personally, <laughs> <laughs> I think they've all uh, perished. Without the chicken suit repair men, they weren't able exactly. to, uh, yeah. to get anywhere. <laughs> um, or, or and, equally, they could be on a planet somewhere and a whole new civilization yeah. could have grown up. You just don't know. And this is where you need silly fan fiction, really, isn't it? Just to, well, to this is where you go, actually, we're looking for a new antagonist. You go, oh, okay. There you go. Yeah. You know, yeah. Ackerman, get him back. <laughs> yeah, Ackerman um, back, yeah. Yeah. Um, and just finally, it's a similar one, really, um, which I'm, I'm, just, I'm certain is going to have the same sort of answer, but... Um, Lister's kids as well, because um, I don't think we've ever heard back about when he, the, the, the two um, twins that he gave birth to. No, and that's going to be a tough one to write that because he's, he's going to have to, I was thinking about this only yesterday, weirdly, um, he's going to have to go back in time and get a much younger body than the body <laughs> he presently has. Uh, and that yeah. might be just a little bit beyond our budget at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, they, they, they can youngify now, can't they? As they did in um, the Irishman. 
the Irish, yes, yeah. but, but, but not to that extent. <laughs> <laughs> we might have to wait a little bit uh, until we can do an all CG 23 year old Craig. Um, and you know, characters have uh, come and gone from Red Dwarf. You know, Rimmer left for a period and came back. Um, <laughs> so, same with Holly, who makes a spectacular comeback in, uh, in Promised Land. Um, are there other other characters who you could foresee returning at a yeah. future point? You know, for, for Kachansky, for example. Yeah, of course, absolutely. Yeah, definitely, 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 definitely. I mean, basically, if often if people want to come back, we'll we'll we'll, we'll try and get them in, mm. uh, especially if it's if it's if it's you know integral to the story. So I checked with Norman, went out for an Indian with him. Do you want to come back? Yes, he did. Great, brilliant. I'll, I'll write you in. In fact, weirdly, with Norman, Norman wrote to me, I was doing the, just writing the last show uh, of Series 12, and he said, I hear you're doing New Red Wars, so I'd like to come back. And he was like, Norman, I've just done 11 scripts. <laughs> um, I'll write you in for the last show, but that's all I'm going to be able to do because it's a massive rewrite to put you in now. And if we do any more, I'll get you in. So um, that's, that was really how Norman came back. What's happening, dudes? We're stranded on this moon in Starbug Hall. No water, no food, no supplies. Is there any way to get out? Have you considered opening the door? <laughs> We're buried alive under a sandstorm, Holly. Gotcha. Let me run some deep analysis, probability-based event scenarios. I'll be back when I've done it. Right, I've done it. <laughs> so soon? That's amazing. I'm not pretending this is going to be easy, and I have to get the calculations just right. OK, what's the plan? I take one of Red Dwarf's thermonuclear mining torpedoes <laughs> and I blow up the moon. <laughs> and you'll be thrown clear in the blast. Is that safe? I'm miles away, I'll be fine. <laughs> no, is it safe for us? Well, I'm no expert. But I wouldn't have thought so, no. Um, we just finally also just wanted to go through kind of the biggest influences on you, on you both over the years, um, both on Dwarf, but also just as you as writers and filmmakers. Um, obviously, the show itself was based on the sketch series um, Dave Hollins on Son of Cliche, but what, what sort of shows, films, books, etc. over the years were like the big influences on, on you both? I mean, I used to read a lot of science fiction when I was at school, um, Asimov, you know, Highland, you know, all the sort of greats. Um, and, but it was actually, strangely, w Rob and I watched Dark Star. And uh, I remember so vividly, uh, we had a, a house in sale that we rented. Coming out, going to the car to drive to the pub, and me saying to him, and we had the conversation over the roof of the car, <laughs> it's really weird that no one's done a, a sitcom like that. And Rob went, yeah, it is, isn't it? And we both got in the car and drove off and didn't have a converse, another conversation about that for years. And then we were doing Spitting Image and we wanted to do our own sitcom, wanted to be a bit different. And we, and we arrived at the idea of, oh, Dave Hollings, let's do something of Dave Hollings and turn that into a uh, science fiction uh, comedy. Um, and and it, it went from there. This is still a trader, Dave Hollins, calling Earthcom number KE57. My craft, Scion 4, is locked in a decaying orbit around a Class II planet. The main drives have gone and there is no power left in the star hopper. I'm at a planet that has two suns and seven moons. My AA number is Hall 7142. <laughs> Yeah, same to you, Rich. Um, is there anything? Yeah, I mean, I remember sort of my memories with science fiction. I mean, I, I remember watching Sleeper, the Woody Allen sci-fi, you know, and thinking mm. and, and, and loving that, as sort of silly as it was. But um, I mean, I'm mainly fans of, uh, of comedy and science fiction. You know, I love everything from I love Gattaca, that movie. I love Matrix, you know, Star Wars. Um, I love Mad Max Fury Road. It's <laughs> you know, lately the new and I love the Judd Apatow comedies. I like some of the broader, you know, Step Brothers, Will Ferrell comedies. Um, but you know, now I, you know, Black Mirror. I love, I love the stories they tell. Um, I've never really watched Doctor Who. That's the one I've, I've never really <laughs> same. <watched. laughs> yeah, yeah. I've, I've, I've asked a friend to kind of give me the. Give me the entry level episode, so I think I know. <laughs> yeah, I tried try to do that with Tom. <laughs> yeah, it's all a bit, it's all a bit manic for me. Um, yeah, 
but but yeah i'm i'm a big fan of you know comedy spinal tap those kind of shows and and, and sci-fi so i'm always excited to see and also you do have an encyclopedic you know knowledge of a lot of tv series i mean wasn't it didn't you watch every single episode of fraser fraser and then seinfeld yeah yeah sure yeah i mean sitcoms those sort of classic sitcoms I, I yeah love. and i know there's nothing worse than asking what's next when you've just put something or just about to put something like a promised land out into the world but um and again you know so much depends on the channel and the, and the commissioner and what and what they want but do you already have thoughts about um what could be next for red dwarf do you already have like other stories in mind for what could be next yes lots lots of different stories and but until they actually go yes okay you know, kind of don't narrow it down depends on the budget depends mm. who we can get to be in it who wants to do it quite interesting i suppose when, when you've been writing a show so long because you know when doug will send, send me a draft then and he'll say, oh, I've got these sort of spare scenes, this folder, some spare scenes in it. And it will, it will literally be 650 pages long scenes. Some of them will be, you know, rewritten. And you get through and you're like, this is an amazing idea. This, you know, or this is a great, you know, plot and it's too big to go in this or, or but then sometimes there's a scene or a strand, you could go, this could go, you know, in and, and it could work well. So there are a million ideas there, but it's, I suppose it's hard, isn't it, for you to focus on something until... You know, you, at this point, we don't know if anything's happening or if it's a special or a series or, yeah. or, or which route. So. Yeah, and also, uh, I do want to do something new as well. So it's, it's juggling the two. Mm. Mm. Did, did you enjoy um, working on the, in the 90-minute format, though? Could you imagine doing that again, possibly in future? Absolutely loved it. Absolutely loved it. Just, just wonderful. I mean, it was difficult because... There were huge problems which we had to overcome. Danny was doing um, a one-man show, uh, a tribute to Sammy Davis Jr. Um, So he wasn't available for for chunks of it. Um, Craig was doing the gadget show, uh, and he wasn't available for for chunks of it. And then Robert Llewellyn got really ill, and he he was just uh, in hospital, first at home, then in hospital, then recuperating, so he wasn't there. So we did have this absolutely bizarre situation uh, on some days of only having Chris Barry there. And of course, all the scenes involved more than Chris Barry. And so um, it was just so difficult. Um, but I did absolutely love doing it. I love, I love the format of, of the film length um, and would love to do more. Well, whatever happens next, it's a very exciting time to be a Red Dwarf fan. So I remember when I was a kid and you had to wait between series six and seven, even though it was only like four or five years at the time, it felt like an eternity. It felt like forever <laughs> <laughs> yeah. to resolve that cliffhanger. Yeah. Yeah. And then yeah. the same again between obviously eight and um, back, back yeah. to earth. So as now it's like, it's really exciting. It's keeps coming back. Oh, well, that's great to hear. Great to hear. Well, that's, that's about everything. Thanks so much for, well, for joining us, to both of you. Thanks, guys. Thanks Tom. Well, Thanks for guys. Make sure everyone to check out Red Dwarf The Promised Land. Uh, it airs Thursday, April 9th on Dave. And you can also catch up on UK TV Play. It's really good. And it's also available on Amazon as Blu-ray. I discovered about 10 minutes before I came on it. There you go. Perfect. <laughs> Just in time to plug. <laughs> Brilliant. Well, thanks so much, guys. It's really Bye. great talking to you both. Cheers, guys. Thank you. We are fleeing from the feral cats who seek to kill us for spreading your teachings. Do you think I'm some kind of god? I'm a nobody, really. Come on, guys, back me up here. He's a less than nobody, nobody. absolute zero. Act like a god. Act like a god? You've scarcely mastered human. Try everything we have! We're stranded on this moon. Is there any way to get out? Have you considered opening the door? With a posse. With a boys from the dwarf. A feature-length special, Red Dwarf, The Promised Land, new and exclusive to Dave. And we're back. There we have it. That was uh, so much fun talking to the Nailers. I thought, I thought we nailed it. Oh, you are clearly not a comedy writing genius of the ilk of Doug Naylor. <laughs> Obviously not. Well, anyway, well, thank you very much for joining us. I hope you're all okay, um, wherever you are. Uh, thanks very much for listening, as ever. We'll be back with a traditional episode next time. And fingers crossed, it might be coming a lot sooner than usual. Uh, we we got, no excuse. We've got nothing else to do. Nothing else to do. Uh, yes, but no, uh, absolutely stay at home, stay safe. And, and what can you do to entertain yourself at a time like this? You should listen to Two Geeks. We've got loads 
loads of archive episodes that you can now listen to uh, on our website, which is uh, two geeks, two beers.com. And if you have any ideas for uh, future topics you'd like us to cover or even uh, future interview subjects, uh, people you'd like to see us speak to and, you know, be realistic. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but, but, you know, we, we spoke to Doug Naylor and come on, that's, that's a pretty good get right. So, so who knows? Yeah. Maybe, maybe, maybe think big. Um, but if you have any ideas or feedback about the show, you can email us um, on podcast at two geeks, two beers.com. And you can also subscribe uh, via iTunes and or Apple Music, whatever it's called now, wherever you can get your podcast <laughs> from. We are on there, even Spotify now. Um, mm. And head over to our Patreon, which uh, we'll have lots of extra goodies, including that special uh, episode I mentioned at the beginning where um, it was all about Morgan trying to explain to me the latest series of Doctor Who because I had no idea what was going on. And it, it was a hoot. It's 25 it minutes. It was a hoot. Now, so. <laughs> <laughs> we thought it would take five minutes. It took 25. Yeah. yeah. And all our, we're slowly uploading stuff to YouTube as well. So head over to there. So what am I going to leave with? I had to think about the sort of music we're going to well, play. We've already done a, a, a traditional Red Dwarf episode. I know, exactly. So you can't just play the theme again, or at least not the regular theme. No, right? so I, th- I thought I'd go for a different theme, and it feels like we're in a kind of Wild West situation at the moment, doesn't it? It all seems a bit weird. So oh. what, what, what a segue. <laughs> Smooth, seamless. So I've, I've gone for uh, the theme music played at the end of Gunman of the Apocalypse by Howard Goodall. Mm. It's, it's a beautiful piece of music, if you ask me, and uh, it's making brilliant. So enjoy this. And we'll see you soon. We're all riding off into an unknown horizon. That's how you do a segue. Since I've been in lockdown, I've just been eating constantly. It's going to happen, isn't it? Yeah, just eating and drinking. Any, and... any um, exercise whatsoever. Not that I ever did anyway. <laughs>